Last week we were talking about the eye, and uh, Ron, did you get somebody to teach that class? Because there's you, there's a teacher. You can grab Stephanie if you want to grab her. I know she'll volunteer. We need a teacher for this class here. Yes. Uh huh. Thank you. You can stay after class and I'll go through everything with you. <laughs> Remedial training. All right, last week we talked about the eye. Uh, we, I mentioned that there were six basic parts uh, or regions in our eye. We talked about the cornea of the eye. We talked about the lens of the eye, the vitreous of the eye. Uh, and we want to talk about the retina. This is the most delicate part of the eye. Uh, and this is the only place where a part of the nervous system of the human body can be seen by medical science. The retina is made up of two major kinds of receptors, if you will. One kind is called the rods. Uh, the other kind is, uh, well, I might mention the rods respond to the presence or absence of light. Uh, and thus send only black and white vision to the brain. The other kind is called the cones, and there are three kinds of cones. Uh, if you want to think about the marvel of the first color TVs, and I had never thought about this, but I remember when uh, I was still a representative with Pfizer, the district manager here in Oklahoma City, he had one of the first color televisions. It was a big screen color TV, and he had this, this uh, lens in the back here, and it had only three colors. And yet those three colors combine to make a, a picture on the, the uh, screen that he was watching and everything. He thought that was a great marvel. Well, God had already designed that and everything in our eyes. Because uh, one kind responds to red light. And when a red light shines into the eye, only the red cones are activated and send a signal to the brain. Uh, similar cones exist, though, of blue and green. And... Uh, if all three cones are activated, the brain identifies the light as white. Uh, if red and green are activated, the brain in interprets the color as yellow. And thus, with only three kinds of cones, all the colors of the spe spectrum can be seen. And this is exactly what the early color televisions did. They took information from what they had learned about the eye that God had already designed, and they made the first color television. Only birds and some insects uh, apes and men have these cones and can di distinguish colors. There is clearly no sequence as evolution would predict, but rather a carefully designed system being used by different ways in different life forms. Another part of the eye then is the fovea. And this is part of the retina which sends a clear image to the brain. And it is about the size of a pinhead and yet it is, it is the vision center if you will. Uh, when we look at something, we focus it on the fovea. And the fovea is made up of very special cells with uh, special sensitivity, which serves a most important function. Uh, the location of the fovea is also very critical. Uh, it must be directly behind the lens to avoid any distortion. And it can't be too close to the optic nerve. Uh, because the optic nerve is the blind spot in the eye where no image can be sent. And so many animal forms do not possess a fovea, but man's status on earth is determined by this pinhead center of vision. Then there's the optic nerve and the brain, and it serves as the real seeing part of the eye. Uh, the optic nerve gathers signals from various parts of the retina and brings the signals to the brain. And any failure in the optic nerve or the brain negates all the work of the other parts of the eye. The brain actually does the seeing, though. We may not think about that, but the eye is just the lens. The, the brain does the seeing. The first thing it does is, is to turn the vision over. The lens acts like any other converging lens and focuses the image upside down on, on the retina. And the brain has been proven to invert the image so it is right side up again as we see it. The brain is God's computer storing information and following logical processes to arrive at its, at its interpretation. 
and try to dream up, if you will, a series of singularly beneficial accidents which would explain the development of these six systems because this is exactly what the non-believer or the evolutionist would have to do unless they recognize and accept the fact that there was a supreme being that created this. Attempt, if you will, to postulate any reasonable set of events which could produce the eye. Any one of these highly specialized sections, including some that we have not considered, defy a mechanical chance explanation. Realize, though, that we are talking about only one small organ in a body made up of dozens of such parts. Another part that we'll look at here, if I can get Junior here to work, is the ear, the human ear. And one writer noted, amazingly, the inner ear, although no bigger than a hazelnut, contains as many circuits as the telephone system of a good-sized city, according to Guinness, 1987. So would anyone suggest that a city's telephone system could design itself? And obviously not. We know that it took a lot of, of uh, study, a lot of science to develop the telephone system. Dr. Linehan in, even went so far as to remark that the level of sensitivity within the human ear is far beyond the achievement of any microphone and represents the ultimate limit of performance. And so when you really think about the human ear, Uh, it's, it's really a marvelous piece of equipment that was designed by God. Uh, the problem is we abuse it like other parts of our body too. And young people especially are notorious for abusing their hearing. Some older people too. It drives me crazy to be driving down the street and all of a sudden I hear this boom, boom, boom. And I know for a fact that the uh, audiologists are just chomping the bits, waiting for a chance to get hold of that individual because they know eventually they're going to need hearing aids because they've destroyed this perfect instrument that God has designed for man to be able to hear and enjoy life, enjoy the birds, enjoy the animals, and enjoy, enjoy each other. Uh, any comments about the ears? We had a visitor last week, and she was so... Do what, Wilma? I said, you just got that one, you don't have good hearing. Yeah. My son doesn't have good hearing. He just found out today, he's, well, he probably, his $5,000 hearing aid, which he's going to get. And he's so excited about it. Yeah, I just bought new hearing aids, and they cost 5000 bucks. Fortunately, my insurance paid 3000 of it, though. So I was lucky. A lot of insurance won't pay for it. My grandfather, uh, sad story, he loved to go hunting. And he had two buddies hunting with him, and they all three had double barrel 12 gauge shotguns. And they were walking along, and, and this uh, flock of ducks flew up, and they pulled up their shotguns, and all three of them fired at the ducks. He was in the center, broke both of his eardrums. And we did a lot of tests on him, and there was absolutely no way he could ever get that hearing back. So it's something we shouldn't take for granted. God has created the perfect hearing. And uh, uh, we, we certainly need to take care of it just as we take care of the rest of our body. But as I was about to say, we had a visitor last week. She comes here uh, every time they come to Oklahoma City. She visits with us, her and her husband, Earl and Nancy. And uh, she was so excited about what we were talking about. She said, I was writing notes as fast as I could, but Dale was talking so fast. So I'm going to try to talk a little bit slower uh, because I know some people do write notes and, and are interested in, in making some notes on these slides. So if I get too fast, just let me know. But if you have a comment, let us know as well. That's why we have mics on both sides so that everybody can hear your comments. But let's talk about the human hand for just a moment. The human hand is a, an amazing instrument, and we don't really appreciate the human hand until we no longer have the human hand. Or if we miss one finger, we don't really appreciate it until we miss that finger. If the most gifted scientists used their brains, they probably could not come up with a stronger or more perfect tool for grasping and delicate manipulation than the human hand. Uh, and seen from an engineering standpoint, the loveliest hand is a highly complex mechanical device composed of muscle, uh, bone, tendon, fat, 
and extremely sensitive nerve fibers capable of performing thousands of jobs with precision. This was published by Wiley in 1962. And I'm not going to say any more about the hands. We all appreciate the fact that these are uh, designed perfectly for us. Uh, we learn to do a lot of things with our hands. And uh, until you talk with someone who has had an amputation, uh, you cannot appreciate just how much and how important the hand is. Or until you injure that hand. Or those of you that's ever had a broken arm and you've had that hand in a cast and you've not been able to use that arm and that hand, you realize then just how valuable it is. Uh, those of you who are right-handed, if you could not use that, you would be pretty lost, wouldn't you? And if you're left-handed, like me, you would be pretty lost as well. Uh, there's only two things I can't do left-handed. I can't swing a golf club and I can't swing a baseball bat. I have to be right-handed for that. So I could be in big trouble if I lost both of them. But at any rate, the hand is a perfect tool for us to use, and yet we still abuse the hand as well because we sometimes take it for granted. Uh, and we will injure the hand unknowingly sometimes. Another instrument that is important for us to realize is the human heart. The human heart, uh, I could say a lot about the human heart. The heart is an involuntary muscle that beats about 100,000 times a day or nearly 40 million times in a year. It pumps about 1,800 gallons of blood a day. In a lifetime, a heart will pump some 600,000 metric tons of blood. And the question is, what causes the heart to beat? It contains a small patch of tissue called the sinus node or cardiac, uh, a cardiac pacemaker. And somehow, about every eight-tenths of a second, it produces an electrical current, which is a jump start, uh, to certain nerve fibers which stimulate the muscular uh, muscular contractions that send the blood flowing uh, at up to 10 miles per hour throughout the body. This is a very perfect instrument that could not have been developed by chance. And when you really think about the heart, uh, the body's blood supply, which gets depleted of oxygen, is pumped back to the heart. From there it is conveyed to the lungs where it is re-oxygenated and sent once more to the various parts of the body. Blood, therefore, is being continuously pumped into and out of the heart with its rhythmic beating. Evolutionists, Miller and Gold, or Goldie, uh, have conceded that for a pump that is keeping two separate circulatory systems going in perfect synchronization, it is hard to imagine a better job of engineering. Now, think about this for just a moment. When, we, uh, when a person has a heart attack, generally it's because we've abused our body in some way. God has created a perfect heart that will take care of us for a long period of time. And let me tell you how significant this is. As we grow older, uh, I think that God knew that we would not always consume the best foods in the world. He probably knew that we would probably develop uh, fast foods, fattening foods. Uh, and we would consume these things and we would develop plaque in our arteries. All this is is nothing more than fat that solidifies and it becomes plaque. Well, the heart is, is an instrument that um, it's a muscle and it will develop a protective shield around that plaque. But what happens sometimes, the plaque will hemorrhage and it will cause a blood clot. And that blood clot is what causes the heart attack. If you had a heart attack, uh, one of the arteries they call the Widowmaker, if you had a heart attack at a young age, say 30 to 40 years old, you would die from that heart attack. But the same heart attack in a 60 to 70 year old man, they would survive, or woman. There's, there's a reason why they would survive, is because God has designed a heart to where it develops what is known as a collateral circulation around that heart because the heart being a muscle requires a lot of oxygen. And so these larger vessels and everything, they develop small vessels, collateral circulation around it. So if that large vessel got stopped up by a blood clot, the smaller vessels would take over and you would continue to have blood flow to the heart. And sometimes you may still experience a significant heart attack and you may think that there might be a little bit of damage to that heart, 
but it goes into a, what they call a myocardial hibernation. It doesn't really kill the muscle, but it will rejuvenate itself to the point that it will start functioning once again because of that collateral circulation. God has designed a perfect instrument here that man cannot explain how this tool works so well. Any thoughts or any comments? Well, <clears throat> genes and DNA, with the advances in understanding fundamentals about life from the Human Genome Project, it is hard to believe that anyone could seriously believe that life developed by mere chance and the cells in the human body number into the trillions. In each cell has genes filled with DNA which is coded with information concerning every aspect of the physical being. And it is estimated that a translation into English of the DNA codes found in one cell of the human body would fill a thousand volume encyclopedia set. We mentioned this a little bit last week. A brief look at an article dealing with the complexity and order of this code suggests that there must be a code maker behind the process. It could not have been done by chance. Well, all right, we looked at then, we are talking about the case of God. We've already looked at the cosmological uh, argument. We just completed the teleological argument. And I told you that we would look at the anthropological arg argument uh, for just a little bit. So let me address it this way. When you look at the anthropological argument, the expression ought and ought not are in everyone's vocabulary, isn't it? While it is true that a person may become so insensitive that he abandons virtually all of his personal ethical obligations, he will never be willing to ignore the lack of such in those who would abuse him. All right? So morality then, morality is, uh, well, I guess I should have put that slide up there. All right. Now, there we go. Morality is uniquely a human trait. A fact conceded even by unbelievers. And for example, although evolutionist George Gaylord Simpson argued that man is the result of a purposeless and materialistic process that did not have him in mind, he admitted that good and evil, right and wrong, concepts irrelevant in nature except from the human viewpoint become real and pressing features of the whole cosmos as viewed morally because morals arise only in man. And this was published in 1951. Okay, so uh, when we look then at the anthropological argument, uh, animals do not operate according to any ethical code. A dog feels no pangs of conscience when it steals a bone from its peers. A cock knows no remorse when mortally, mortally wounding another. So what are our origin, uh, origins then? And the point is that there are only uh, two options. Morality and ethics are either theocentric, that is, centered in an eternal source of ex uh, eternal goodness, namely God, or anthropocentric, that is, grounded in the mind of man as a creature that evolved naturally as a result of inanimate forces operating over eons of cosmic and geologic time. Uh, and this was Giesler and Cordon in 1988. So, let's look at some anthropological examples. And if this doesn't help you to fully appreciate God's wisdom, uh, then you missed it. The first thing I want to address is the father before birth. And in order to address the father before birth, this is in the Annals of Entomological Society of America in 1966. And it's an account of a strange form of life identified as a dactyladium. It's a mite. A little small mite, all right? When a male mite emerges from its mother's body, the male mite immediately dies. Male mite immediately dies. So, the question is, the mite, being an arthropod, but in this case, the male doesn't seem to have any of the normal arthropod characteristics. Uh, so, how do the mites reproduce when the male dies at birth? 
And this is what's the marvelous thing about what God has done. Because what happens is, the mite larva spends their entire basic life cycle inside their mother's body. Six to nine eggs hatch inside the body of a female mite. And only one of these is a male. Six to nine eggs, but only one is a male. Now, you think about the human race. The ratio of male to female is pretty much equal, isn't it? And when you look at livestock, you look at animals, the ratio to male to female is pretty much equal. But here's a very unique thing of what God has done, because in this six to nine eggs hatched inside the body of the female mite, only one of these is a male. The mother dies at this point, and the mites feed on her from the inside. The male breeds with his sisters inside the mother. The mites then eat their way through the body of their mother, and the females go on their way to locate a new place to repeat the process, and the male dies. Because God has completed the plan here with the male. And in some ways, we might view this as somewhat grotesque. But the process eliminates the difficulties of reproduction. God has made a perfect plan here. The most dangerous time in the life of most animals is when they reproduce. But in this case, the reproduction took place inside the mother's body. Competition and uneven sex populations make caution a secondary consideration for most forms. But the mite doesn't have this problem because there's only one male. And five to eight females. Uh, attempting to explain by chance how there is always one male for every five to eight females is virtually impossible by evolutionist. So if you're able to, to uh, discuss this, this phenomenon, if you will, uh, this normal sex ratio uh, that God has designed here for this mite, you can certainly explain to a non-believer that this is an example of God's wisdom and planning in nature. But it doesn't stop there. Here's another very unique fact. Look at bare facts. Because bears are quite different than most human beings, or, or most animals, I should say. Uh, most hibernating mammals. They don't awaken and feed any time during their hibernation period. During the winter time, they're there in for, for uh, several months. And they seem to virtually shut down many of their biological systems. Uh, researchers have recently discovered that one system which shuts down almost entirely is the kidneys. Now what happens if the kidneys shut down with us? Huh? We die, don't we? Or we get a kidney replaced. Uh, a, a kidney transplant. Uh, we get dehydrated. We're going to die. We have to hydrate those kidneys. We have to keep uh, fluids going through them. Researchers have found that this, this system, blood supplies to the kidneys is greatly reduced and all fluid movement in the kidneys has virtually ceased in the bear. Virtually ceased. One would expect such a stoppage, obviously, as we mentioned, to damage the kidneys, but not in the bear. Blood measurements show no measurable changes in the chemical makeup of the blood and no accumulation of waste products in the bear. Uh, we have gradually realized what a tremendous advantage this shutdown has to this animal. And not only does it rest the kidney and conserve energy consumption in the bear, but it also eliminates dehydration for the bear because they're not eliminating any fluids. It's the perfect system that God has designed for the bear. Uh, if the bear released water and did not replace it, he would eventually die, as you and I would. In deep sleep of hibernation, there is no way to replace the water. Hibernation is a beautiful and obviously very complex way of conserving energy and protecting the bear and protecting his potential food from overconsumption. The design and plan of such a system shows incredible wisdom and could not have occurred by chance, like the non-believers would try to have us believe. And obviously this could not have happened by accident. 
It shows God's incredible design. So all we have to do is look at examples such as this. Here's another good example. The bird, for example. There we go. The bird's bones are designed in such a way that seems to defy an evolutionary explanation. Jensen over here being one who deals in airplanes and all of that, knows full well that man will never be able to develop a plane that will fly the same way a bird can fly, the same way a bird can exist. You see, these bones are filled with a spongy network which fills with air as a bird breathes. And these air cavities are light in weight and are braced with ridges so structural uh, strength is maintained by these bones. And since birds are unique in this characteristic which involves the respiratory and the skeletal system, it would seem difficult to conceive, to conceive of a chance formation. And obviously from what other form could it have evolved? Any thoughts? Any comments? Now let's talk about bees for a moment. In winter, this is something that I didn't know until I got to researching a little bit. So this is very interesting. I always wondered, you know, most insects we think if it's a real cold winter they die. And maybe the eggs that was laid the prior year is what hatches out and we have new insects. That's not the case with a bee. The honeybee, we know most of us like honey, some people don't, but it is a natural food. We know that John the Baptist lived on locusts and honeys. Uh, locusts and honey, not honeys. In winter, bees cluster in the hive and begin a vibratory motion in their muscles which generates enough heat to keep the hive and its cold-blooded occupants from freezing. This is how they survive through the winter. A marvelous creation. In hot weather, they gather outside the hive and fan air into the hive with vigorous wing beating. When a bee returns to the hive from a successful pollen trip, according to Dr. Carl von Fritz, they put a little nectar from, a, from the plant on as many other bees as are needed to harvest that flower. And then, the exploring bee then dances for about 30 seconds, telling those bees exactly where to go, and those bees go directly to that flower. At the conclusion of this dance, they exit, they fly straight to the flower, to the supplying flower. But not only is that interesting about the bees, when you think about their sexual aspect, it is also very unique. Because there are three sexes of bees. There's the queen bee, and there's the drone bees. Uh, and this would be the male and the female. And had no other function than reproductive. That's all those two bees do, the queen and the drone. But then, on top of that, there is the... <clears throat> and I might mention that... Uh, they are different in appearance and in functions, uh, the queens. Uh, uh, the worker bees are neither queens nor drones. And when you see a worker bee, they're, they're completely different than the queen and the drone. And this is genetic, genetically determined and is an inherent in the eggs of the queen. The worker bee hatches out of an unfertilized egg, while the queen and the drones hatch out of fertilized eggs in a normal manner. And this sort of virgin birth is also beyond a trial and error explanation. The unbeliever cannot explain it. We might ask how many experiments that would influence these kinds of things could a hive of bees survive? How did the first bees collect nectar? How did the first bees reproduce three classes? How did the first bees fold their wings, cool and heat their hive if they are merely mutated flies or some other form or come from some other form? 
It would seem that the intelligence that created and designed the first bee built into the genetic code of that insect the traits that the insect would need to survive. And this would explain the creation. Isn't it more reasonable to explain this fantastic design by God than blind hope, than by chance, uh, that somehow a chance hypothesis might work? If there is design, the best explanation of that design then, especially when it is so elaborate and complex, is that it was obviously designed by God. And I, don't th I know that there's no one in here that would disagree with that. Well, <clears throat> what about the arrangement of the land? We look at our earth and we, we think, well, this is a majestic earth here. We have mountains in some places, we have oceans, we have lakes, we have valleys. Uh, one of the things on my bucket list is go to the Grand Canyon. Some of you have been there, I've never been there. But all I've seen is pictures and I know how majestic that is. It is well known by virtually everyone that dark colored objects absorb heat better than light colored ones. Would everybody agree with that? God has designed the perfect arrangement of the land when you consider that. Because few people realize that this fact has a great deal to do with where the land masses of earth are located. But it obviously does when you think about it. Where is most of the land located? Most of the land of the earth, where is it located? Southern hemisphere or northern hemisphere? Huh? Southern or northern? How many say northern? How many say southern? Well, the answer is northern. The answer is northern. Now think about this for a minute. Most of the land mass on the earth is located in the northern hemisphere and this means that the southern, southern hemisphere is mostly surf, surfaced with water and ice, which are light-colored materials. Light-colored materials. Land mass is darker. All right? So why is this important? Well, if you think about it for just a minute, during the summer in the United States, the earth is at its greatest distance from the sun at its greatest distance from the sun. During the summer in the southern hemisphere, which is our winter, the earth is closest to the sun. And if most of the land mass with its dark color was located in the southern hemisphere, too much heat and light would be absorbed and that hemisphere would overheat because it's closest to the sun. All right? Because the southern hemisphere is mostly water, very little heat percentage-wise, is absorbed. And what is absorbed is contained in the water, thus enabling it to warm the colder places on the earth in either hemisphere. Since the dark land surface in the northern hemisphere is pointed toward the sun in our summer, maximum absorption occurs, thus compensating for our greater distance from the sun. Indeed, we see an amazing system which provides so beautifully for the needs of mankind or life upon the earth. And this is just one of a myriad of design features we see in the earth's structure and arrangement in space. And any one of these might justifiably attribute to chance. But when we realize the interdependence of all these features, we cannot in academic honesty, attribute them to accident because they clearly show design by a wise designer. Any thoughts? Let's talk about our atmosphere for just a moment. Today, there's a lot of concern about air pollution, isn't there? And there is air pollution out there, particularly when we look at our larger cities. One of the biggest concerns is cities like Los Angeles and New York right now. During the summertime, when there's air pollution, they advise you to go out and, with a mask or don't go out at all. Uh, but when you think about the concern over air pollution and other effects of man on his air 
ocean, if you will, and I'm going to talk about the atmosphere being the air ocean, uh, more and more information is coming to light about our atmosphere. For example, the more we learn about this air and its design, the more impressed an honest man has to be with the intelligence of his designer. We cannot just take it for granted that we go out every morning or we wake up in the morning and we breathe naturally because there's oxygen in the air. But it becomes more obvious with each day that attempts to explain the Earth's atmosphere in terms of cosmic cause and effect are doomed to failure. There is no rational way the structure and function of our atmosphere can be explained without admitting to the fact that intelligence was necessary to create this atmosphere. As we look for properties in the atmosphere which are clues to its origin, its thickness comes up first. For example, our air is just the right density to burn up the 10,000 plus meteors that strike the earth every year. This is why our scientists will show those pictures of all those asteroids and those meteors up there circling the earth. And while they may be concerned about every one of those striking the earth, God has created the atmosphere that is just the right density to burn them up even the one that went over Russia exploded before it hit the ground, and then there were particles there, but it was in the process of burning up. It was a pretty large asteroid, or it would not have made it as far as it did. And there are examples where meteors or asteroids have made it to Earth before. But when you see the mass of these meteors and asteroids up there circling the Earth, if it wasn't for God's design, you would think there would be a lot of those things come down here. But God has designed the perfect atmosphere. It, all, it is also dense enough to scatter the cosmic rays and x-rays of the sun so that we are protected from this dangerous radiation. It is just thin enough to allow light to penetrate to give plants the ability to grow and to keep the proper gases near the surface of the earth for all living things to use. And it is also at this point that the composition chemically of the Earth's atmosphere comes into the picture. For example, our Earth has enough carbon dioxide to produce what is called the greenhouse effect. And we hear our scientists talking about the greenhouse effect a lot. But this gas allows the rays of the sun to reach the Earth, but does not allow the heat produced by these rays to be re-radiated back into space. This traps the heat just as the glass in your car does, making your car unbearable in the summer heat. We have just enough of this gas to keep us warm, but not so much to overheat us. And to top all of this, God has placed a layer of gas called ozone high in our atmosphere. We talk about the ozone hole, or the hole in the ozone. But scientists will talk about how big it is one day and the next day or next year or so. They say it seems to be shrinking that hole. God has designed the perfect atmosphere for us. And that ozone is placed up there. And this layer of gas is capable of absorbing ultraviolet exposure to the sun. Without it, we would be essentially cooked. We could go on and on relating these factors to weather, such as climate, life, support systems, and a myriad of other variables. But the point is that even in our blue sky, we see the mind of God at work here. We see his great creation. And the attempt to explain all of these variables in terms of chance or cosmic evolution is an exercise in vanity. Well, one more. If, uh, there we go. Yeah, I go back there. Water. I want to talk about water for just a moment, and that'll probably conclude for today. And then next week we'll talk about designs of symbiotic relationships. Most liquids reach their greatest density at freezing point, don't they? Have you ever thought about the winter, though, and the lakes and everything? If liquids reach their greatest density at freezing point, why is it that the ice is on top and the water underneath has not frozen. If the ice was denser than the water underneath, what would happen? 
the lake, the ice would go down. The lake would eventually freeze solid. And what would happen to all the sea life? What would happen to all of the fishes and the vegetation in the water? Water reaches its greatest density at 39 degrees Fahrenheit. 39 degrees Fahrenheit. At temperatures below that level and to its freezing point, water expands, making ice float on top of water. And that is the reason why the ice does not sink, even when you put ice cubes in your drink, your beverage at home. The ice doesn't sink, does it? It floats. God has created the perfect environment here for life in water. Any thoughts? Could not have happened by chance. No thoughts? Well, I know our time is about up, and I really don't want to get into uh, symbiotic relationships too much, but let me just mention a symbiotic relationship is one in which two organisms mutually benefit each other to the point where they are dependent upon one another for survival. They are dependent upon one another for survival. And so we'll talk about that next week.